Hello everyone, my name is Martin Woods. I'm the Curator of Maps and Research Programs here at the National Library of Australia in Canberra. From wherever you're watching, welcome to this digital-only event recorded by the National Library. Through the internet, we can connect with people and places around the country, but it's important that we take a moment to connect ourselves with the people and place in which we find ourselves. I acknowledge and celebrate the traditional owners of the land on which the library sits, the Ngambri and Ngunnawal peoples, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I thank them for caring for this land on which we find ourselves at the library. In this special online event, library curatorial manager Susanna Hellman is joined in conversation by former National Museum of Australia curator long-time cycling enthusiast and author Daniel Oakman. To celebrate the release of Daniel's latest work, Wild Ride, Epic Cycling Journeys Through the Heart of Australia. Come explore some of the collection material that tells the stories of the people behind these great cycling adventures and the roads they travelled. Here at the library, there are books on many aspects of cycling, maps from the Australian cycling's early days to the present, photos of cyclists famous or less so, pictures and stories about great cycling journeys of the past. About the only thing you won't find in the collections is a bicycle, but there are plenty out in the car park. Cycling forms a small but important and at times surprising part of libraries' Australian collections. As a map curator and cyclist, I'm keenly aware of the role of maps in cycling in the Australian cycling story, and I'm pleased that some of our rare early Australian maps feature in Daniel's book, and in the stories of cyclists as they navigate sometimes vast distances, rough roads, the weather and other challenges. So please enjoy this conversation between Daniel Oakman and Susanna Hellman as they discuss some of these fascinating stories in Wild Ride. Hello, I'm Susanna Hellman. I'm a curator in the exhibition section of the National Library of Australia. We're here in the preservation laboratories of the National Library, and I'm here with Daniel Oakman, a historian who's written a new book um, called Wild Ride, Epic Cycling Journeys Through the Heart of Australia. And this book, which is coming out soon, uses some of the library's um, fantastic cycling collections. So we're here really to um, look at some of these objects in the flesh and talk to Daniel. Um, so what would you like to start with? Right. Thanks, Susanna. Thanks for having me here at the library. I mean, the first thing I should say is the book is really a celebration of endurance cycling in Australia. And it covers some of the most daring, audacious and influential bike rides that were ever undertaken in this country. The kind of rides that really changed people's perceptions of the land, its people, but also themselves. And that's something I was really keen to try and capture in the book and by exploring the collections here at the National Library. Uh, I really hope to sort of dig really deep and, and pull out those stories. Uh, the book really starts uh, in the late 19th century, looking at some of the overlanding cyclists like Francis Bertels, Jerome Muriff, um, and goes all the way through to the modern phenomenon of bikepacking and looks at some of the modern day explorers, cycling explorers like Kate Leeming and her 25,000 kilometre ride around Australia. Uh, it also looks at some of the more eccentric bike rides that have gone on. Uh, and here I'm thinking of Samuel Johnson, the actor Samuel Johnson and his 15,000 kilometre unicycle ride around Australia. So it's the, the full tour, if you like, of, of endurance riding in Australia. So what really inspired you um, to write it? Really inspiration came, I guess, from, from two points. The first was through my own cycling. And I will hasten to say that uh, my riding is, you know, pales by comparison to the people we're talking here. Um, but in some ways, the kind of uh, feelings that you get by riding long distances are, are much the same. And that's that connection to uh, uh, nature, uh, using the bike as a, as a way of exploring the country. Uh, is, is a unique thing to do and the bicycle puts the rider in a, in a particularly interesting relationship to, to nature and the world around them. So that's something I thought I would like to explore historically. Um, and there was a, also a moment when I was looking at the library's collections while I was developing an exhibition about cycling, uh, when I was reading uh, this book here, which is by uh, a writer called Jerome Muriff. 
and it's called From Ocean to Ocean. And he was the first person to ride from Adelaide to what was then Port Darwin in 1894. He did this ride not necessarily to break records or anything, he just simply wanted to kind of expose himself to the, to the wildness of the country. And so he did the ride over about two months and then he wrote this fabulous book about it. It's absolutely terrific account. And in reading it, um, really all the elements that I was kind of looking to explore in this early period of cycling were there. There were encounters with the land, uh, with indigenous people, um, and also his kind of transformation as he rode across the country. He becomes almost, there's a spiritual dimension to his, his work where he becomes almost part of the landscape. So that was really kind of set up the, the kind of guiding principle that I then um, started looking for in other, other cycling adventurers. Mm. But how did you then choose, I suppose, which riders to focus on, um, starting with yeah. him and then moving on through some of the people we see? Yeah, good, good question. So the, the criteria was pretty, uh, pretty tough. Um, so, you know, in the late 19th century, early, early 20th century, there was a lot of cycling going on. It seemed to be that um, one cycling got going and you know, everyone was sort of tearing across the country doing, doing big bike rides. So my criteria couldn't just be that they were the first or the fastest or the, or the longest. Um, there had to be something else. And some, in some cases, or in a surprising number of cases, some of these writers went on to write books. Francis Bertels, for, for instance. Um, uh, Jerome Muriff, Arthur Richardson, who was the first person to write around Australia, narrated a book to a newspaper. So there was a kind of documentary record that I could then interrogate and really uh, get a deep understanding of the kind of things they were, they were going through. So that was really the, the, the major criteria. There just had to be something more so that that deeper experience could then be, be, uh, be brought out. Mm -hmm. And we have um, good examples of that, don't we, here with um, some books and photographs and maps as well. Which collections would you like to focus on first? Yeah, well, I can talk about um, one of the most interesting discoveries that I made uh -huh. while I was working here at the library was about this fellow called uh, Joe Pearson, or mm -hmm. Genial Joe, or was he, he was known to his friends, who was really writing late 19th century, early 20th century. And I knew nothing about him until I discovered these particular collections here. And he was a, you have to say he was uh, an in, a cycle touring enthusiast. He absolutely loved New South Wales. He th there, was, there was no place better in the world, according to Joe. He did a cycle tour uh, in the late, in the 19, 1890s. He went to Britain and Europe, did a big cycling tour. He enjoyed it, but he came back feeling, he felt that really there was nowhere else in the world that compared with New South Wales. And he wanted to really get city-based cyclists out into the countryside. So what he did, he did um, often took groups on tours, but his major influence was to create a map. Mm. And he created maps that were specifically tailored for the cyclist and, all, and they contained all the things that cyclists want to know. How far it is to the next town, where they can stay, where they can eat, what the road's like. And these maps were so detailed that he would even annotate, you know, directing them, take this road because it's, uh, the surface is a bit better, you know, come back this way. You know, incredibly rich um, uh, material for, for a cyclist to use. And they sold thousands. First one was in 1896, I think. They had multiple editions into the 20th century and ended up being used as the basis for car touring uh, in sort of the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, but he was an absolute icon in, in terms of New South Wales cycling uh, and an absolute um, you know, passionate enthusiast for the great outdoors and using the bike to you know, improve your spiritual and men mental health. Uh, and his maps were, were something that almost every cycle tourist had. It also had a particular influence for, a particular, particularly positive influence for women because with this sort of information, they no longer needed a, a male chaperone to take them out into the countryside so groups of women could get together and with these maps they could um, get, you know, get out into the countryside themselves. So we've got an example of um, one of Pearson's maps out here. What in particular is so special about this one? Really what, what's, what makes them special is the detail. Mm. Uh, and in this, this is one of the, the earliest ones. They actually got more elaborate as they, got, as they went on. 
and he would actually put out um, you know, suggested itineraries and he would list the, the lodges where you could stay, what they were like, what kind of food you could get there, uh, as well as with a lot more advice to the cyclist, for instance, that he didn't recommend that you should smoke while you were actually riding your bike. Um, so, you know, a fabulously kind of eccentric, uh, but also very practical way for, for cyclists to, to get into the sport. I should mention that he actually went on to do some work for the New South Wales Department of Tourism. Um, and because he was such an enthusiast for, for tourism and, and scenic views, he lobbied for them to uh, erect signage by the roadside that directed people to you know, where they could see you know, different um, panoramic views or tourist sites. And you can see that legacy today, which is in the brown signs that you see along highways and roadways. That's a direct legacy from his, his work. He also lobbied to have the little mileage markers that you see as you're approaching towns, uh, often in five kilometre intervals. Very important for a cyclist if you didn't have means to record how far or fast you were going. Um, again, another legacy to uh, Joe Pearson, a uh, you know, hugely influential person in terms of Australia's cycling history. Mm. Fantastic. And was there something special about the, um, this cover that it came in? Well, this is what the, the, the maps would actually come in these yeah. covers. So he deliberately made them so you could fold them up mm. in this, into these little folio size and put that in your luggage. Mm. Yeah, it was just another sort of, you know, a thoughtful, practical design choice that he, that he came up with. Fantastic. And um, well used, no doubt. Yeah, I, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> we have a very rich collection, um, don't we, at the National Library of Roadmaps. Um, yeah, indeed. I believe, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, so, and then um, there were also, we've also got a photograph, don't we, of a portrait of Pearson? Yeah, I think underneath that one, one there, there's a picture. Yes, of, fantastic. Of genial Joe. And if um, you do have a close up of that, you see he's not looking especially genial in that photograph. Uh, and I believe that one was taken shortly after he became one of the first people to ride a bike to the top of Mount Kosciuszko. So you can forgive him perhaps looking a little bit stern, but uh, he was otherwise known as a very affable, uh, genial cycle tourist. Fantastic. And he was in Tilbert Tilbert, was he? Yeah, for that, for that yeah. photograph, that was yeah, part of his tour, which included uh, summiting Mount Kosciuszko on his bicycle. Fantastic. Do you want to talk about Oppie? Oppie, yeah. Oppie, this uh, fabulous poster here uh, that relates to Hubert Opperman, better known as Oppie, who of course is a, an icon of Australian sport, Australian cycling, uh, rose prominence in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, in the beginning as a, as a racer uh, and as a, as a motor paced rider, led the first Australian tour, uh, team to contest the Tour de France in 1928. Uh, set a slew of records well, around Australia and, and overseas, but it was really his kind of epic rides in Australia during the 30s that cemented him as a household name. And I think this poster's from 1934, when really he's at the, the height of his powers. Um, you know, Melbourne Star is you know, the cycling brand that, uh, that every, every boy wanted. Um, and Oppie and Melbourne Star were, were pretty much synonymous for, for most of the decade and beyond. Um, my interest in him for this book was really to do with his crossing of the Nullarbor in 1937. And he certainly wasn't the first, uh, but he was the fastest. And that was, it was something that kind of nagged at him during his career that he, he hadn't, uh, hadn't really nailed this, this great epic crossing of his own continent. Uh, so in 1937, he, he completed that, he completed the journey with support. So his manager, Bruce Small, was one of the owners of Melbourne Star, travelled behind him in a, in a special caravan and they made the crossing in 14 days. And it was, a, it was I mean, it's still an astounding achievement and it was an absolutely jaw-dropping uh, moment in Australia's sporting history. I had a special, as I delved into the manuscript collections that relate to this particular crossing, um, I discovered some really interesting material. We have some of it here. And it related particularly to the way his ride was marketed, the way it was promoted to the Australian people. Um, now his manager, Bruce Small, was a, a, an incredibly enterprising fellow, uh, probably one of the greatest sort of marketing minds in, in Australian history. Uh, now given he was going to be driving the caravan, uh, he was gonna to be too busy to send off the press reports to the, um, uh, the newspapers. So he 
I guess naturally in some ways, he wrote them before he left. And you can see them here. They're all uh, neatly laid out with elaborate descriptions of what was happening. Now, bearing in mind, this is all before the ride has even taken place. And he's just left little gaps here where his uh, members of his staff could then fill in the times that he was actually passing through a certain town. And that could be sent out to the newspapers and they would write up their reports. So it was an incredibly well-crafted crossing. It did make me think for a while, well, did, did the crossing actually occur? Because um, in some ways, there wasn't many people to see what was happening out there. Did it, did it occur? But of course, after a bit of hunting around, it, it did occur. It was just that the descriptions that went with it uh, were essentially imagined. And it's all documented here. All documented here in, in the, uh, the Hubert Opperman papers, which are you know, a terrific resource. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. And we've also got um, material relating to his um, later life as a politician. As yeah, so he, he went on to become, yeah. have another successful career, 17 year career, mm. career, year career mm. in politics. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. Fantastically rich. And I think also mm. what these objects demonstrate is, I, I suppose, the depth of the library's collection, how broad they are. Um, like we have, you know, posters and manuscripts and all of, and you've pieced all of these things together. Mm. And the photographs too, yeah. which are particularly good. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely. We often hear about great male cyclists. Um, and you mentioned before um, that there are some um, great female cyclists that we might not be aware of. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about those? Yeah, sure, you... sure. Uh, yeah, one thing I, I wanted to get across with the book is that um, we actually have a terrific history of female riders, female endurance riders, mm -hmm. something that's often overlooked in, in Australian sporting history. Mm -hmm. And the book actually starts uh, with a story about Sarah Maddox who was uh, a pioneering female rider, and she was riding in the 1890s um, and achieved kind of national fame, partly because of the debate about what she was wearing, which is something that she, she disliked intensely, that her riding prowess would be kind of, uh, you know, co-opted into a debate about whether women should be uh, wearing dresses or knickerbockers and what was called rational dress. Um, but she was, a, she was an amazing uh, woman, was blind in one eye, yet did some of the, the first, she was the first female to ride from Sydney to Melbourne uh, and also from Sydney to Brisbane. And these, again, at the time, these were, these were as astonishing uh, journeys for a woman, for a woman to take. Um, I also pick up on some female riders in the 1940s and two women in particular. And there's actually two, they, wrote, they both wrote separate books about their journey. And there were two young women from Melbourne, uh, Wendy Law and Shirley Duncan. And they were 19 and 21, respectively, at the time, and set out from Melbourne, firstly to Tasmania, uh, on a little cycle trip around Tasmania, partly to convince their parents that they weren't completely mad. Um, they put their, you know, suspended their jobs, put their boyfriends on hold, and set out on this journey. And they secretly planned not just to do Tasmania, but in fact to do the mainland as well. So they came back to Melbourne and then set out on another a two and a half year working holiday, cycling around Australia as they went. Um, now they were actually sponsored by Melbourne Star, the same people that sponsored Oppie, but were, did not, Melbourne Star did not behave themselves particularly well, were very exploitative, and they had to assert themselves quite strongly in order to get any kind of funding out of Melbourne Star. Uh, who were um, very adept at you know, milking them for publicity as they, as they moved around the country. Um, so there's lots of undercurrents there in that, in that story about women who were then being exposed to kind of commercial uh, powers and Melbourne Star was a significant one at the time. Um, they also came, uh, being you know, two young women, they were uh, exposed to unwanted physical advances. Uh, they, were, uh, they were attacked during their journeys and it was quite a, an eventful time of their lives uh, but they then wrote two, two wonderful books, wonderful de rich and detailed books that are, that are here in the library's collections as well. Oh dear, what a journey. Um. I, can, I can also talk about Kate Leeming which is another person that, that wrote a book about her cycling uh, journeys. Um, now she's still riding today, she's currently planning to ride a bike across Antarctica. Uh, but in the early 2000s, she rode a 25,000 kilometre trip around Australia and through the Australian outback. It was actually a UNESCO 
uh, funded ride to promote issues around sustainability and climate change. Uh, now she produced this another you know, terrific, well-documented book here called Out There and Back. Um, but she's gone on since to do other epic journeys uh, in, in Africa and, and South America. So I guess um, one of the last questions I have is um, the library continues to record the experiences of cyclists and adventurers. Um, can you tell us how you think the way cyclists have represented their adventures has changed over time? Yeah, sure. Um, it was interesting, uh, I think, to actually re review all this material and by the end of writing the book I was in fact reflecting on how little had changed mm -hmm. because cyclists today are still recording their adventures in photographs, in, in writing, mm -hmm. they're still writing books about them, much the same way that they did in the late 19th century. Of course the technology has changed uh, but the kind of the, the impulse to to get out there into the wild under your own power um, and kind of expose yourself to nature and the wilderness uh, is still there. It's the same, I think, uh, as, as, and as uh, intense as, as it ever was. Probably the, the key difference is now that uh, people can write blogs, upload photographs and text messages instantaneously while they're on the ride, whereas in days gone by they had to rush into a telegraph um, post office, send a telegram back to their family to let them know they were okay. Now it can happen more or less straight away um, if you have mobile coverage. Otherwise you're in fact back to a you know a 19th century kind of cycling experience. But And would you say that kind of thing is reflected in what you've learnt about the library's um, collections as well? How um, was there something that I suppose surprised you though in the library's collections? I think the what's fabulous about accessing the library's digital collections is that you can actually get access to to a lot of the blogs uh, and the material that's being produced in you know in abundance now um, cyclists don't have to deal with a publisher uh, or or even a map maker in order to record and convey their journeys to other people they can use all those aspects of the online environment and that's you know that's such an important thing for the library to keep collecting because that that's really where the growth you know the big growth in um, these, these great records about cycling journeys is taking place. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Well, well, thank you very much, Daniel, for uh, talking to us Thank you today. for having me. And um, yes, thank you all for watching. Right, thank you. I wrote Wild Ride because I'm passionate about Australia's cycling history. And once I delved into it, I realised there was so many fabulous, rich and detailed stories to tell. This book is available at the National Library Bookshop.